Welcome to our fourth class in uh, creation science uh, evangelism. The purpose of this class, for those of you just joining us, is to prepare people to be better equipped to handle subjects, questions around the subject of creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And we want our staff, a lot of our staff are taking the class here, to be better prepared to, you know, they're more valuable as workers here if they know more about what we believe, what we teach, and why we teach it. And of course, the object is to get everybody out teaching this. There needs to be thousands of people doing this, uh, one of the goals. So we left off last week talking about the problems with our school system and teaching the kids they're an animal, and sure enough, they, they act like animals, and they can't seem to figure it out. Kids are taught today there are no absolutes. This is an extremely dangerous teaching in the school system about there are no absolutes. I was at the University of Wyoming night before last doing a debate up there in Laramie, Wyoming with my son Eric. He's uh, flying back right now. We're doing any second actually. But, uh, you know, the professor was a philosophy professor. And it's very, very common in philosophy classes at secular universities for the teacher to tell the kids, now there are no absolutes. Why would they teach them that? Well, if there are no absolutes, then you can't say that's wrong because it might be wrong for you, but it's not wrong for me. And therefore, you might think it's wrong to commit adultery, but I don't think it's wrong to commit adultery, so, you know, it's a way of salving their conscience is what it is, okay? To say there are no absolutes. First of all, it's, it's a, you can't have a world without any absolutes. I had a professor one time tell me, he said, there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely sure? Of course, that blew his little brain, you know? He said, you're, that's, you're tricking me. I said, no, it's a logical statement. How can you be absolutely sure there are no absolutes? The kid I mentioned, I think, in here one time about in uh, sophomore and, or senior in high school in Pennsylvania, I was speaking at a public school. Kid sat on the second row. He said, Mr. Hovind, I'm an atheist. He said, there's no God. I said, are you sure? He said, oh, yeah, I'm sure. I said, well, now, do you know everything? He said, no. I said, well, do you know maybe, you know, half of everything? He said, no, I don't know half of everything. I said, well, let's just pretend for a few minutes that you know half of everything. Is it possible then that God exists in the other half you don't know? Wow, brand new thought rattled around his brain for a while and got lost. And then I said, well, son, if, you, if you're an atheist and there's no God, how do you tell right from wrong? He said, well, I decide what's right and wrong. He said, I'm the God of my own universe. And I said, well, I'm glad to hear about that, son, because I'm going to shoot you in five minutes. He said, you can't do that. I said, well, sure I can. You see, I'm the God of my own universe, and I decided it's fine for me to shoot you. What's wrong with that logic? One guy I debated here recently said, well, you know, we have a collective knowledge. We just intuitively know what's right and wrong. Everybody knows right and wrong. Oh, well, let's tell that to Osama bin Laden. He knows it's right to kill anybody who won't convert to Muslim, to be a Muslim. He knows that's right. Let's tell Adolf Hitler because he knows it would be best if the world was all Aryan, you know, and everybody else was, was dis destroyed. He knows that. Adolf Hitler honestly thought he was doing the world a favor by eliminating what he perceived as the inferiors. Is there an absolute standard someplace? Who decides right from wrong? Is this something Bill Clinton should decide? Does he have any idea what right and wrong is all about? You know, would be the question. Is this something, you know, Saddam Hussein should decide? Where, where's the absolute standard? Thus saith the Lord is mentioned in the Bible 413 times. Now that's absolute. See, the Christians have an absolute standard. Suppose I said to you guys doing construction around here, I said, John, we're gonna build a, we're gonna build a building over here, but I'm gonna give everybody a different tape measure. On your tape measure, this is an inch. Now, Kevin, on your tape measure, this is an inch. Okay, and on Nathan, your tape measure, this is an inch. So, how's that building going to look? <laughs> it's going to be a royal mess, isn't it? You have to have a standard. America has the National Bureau of Standards. They keep a standard meter, you know, a stick made out of some kind of special metal. I'm sure it cost a bunch of money because the government paid for it, you know, we paid for it. And they've got this thing in an air-conditioned case that is temperature controlled and humidity controlled and pressure controlled because they don't want it to change at all. So we all know what the standard is. It is so critical to have a standard of measurement, a standard of weights, a standard of volumes. You know, how big is a gallon? Well, there's an absolute standard for a gallon or a liter in metric system or the meter or the foot or the inch. There has to be a standard. You have to have that. And you have to have that in morals too. 
So where in evolution theory, where is the standard for determining right and wrong? Some people say, well, if it doesn't hurt anybody, it's right or wrong. I had a kid tell me that at a college a few weeks ago. I was having a debate there, and he says, well, he said, I like, uh, he said, I'm living with my girlfriend here, and uh, we don't see anything wrong with it. So therefore, it's okay. I said, well, does her dad see anything wrong with it? Do her brothers see anything wrong with it? You know, sure, you may not see anything wrong with it, but what about uh, her grandfather? Would he see anything wrong with it? You know, have you really searched this out? Where's the standard for determining right and wrong? Thus saith the Lord. And the Lord said in Leviticus, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh, nor print any marks upon you. Now, this is an Old Testament law to the Jews, I understand, that don't get any tattoos. Okay? And I haven't gotten any. And some people, we've got eight or ten people on our staff that have them, okay? I don't say you've got to go cut your arm off because you've got a tattoo, but God says don't do it. The point is, there's a standard. Now, what happens is, we tend to make decisions on right and wrong based on what everybody else is doing. Well, everybody else is getting their nose pierced, so I'm going to get mine pierced, you know? Which, what does God say? You've got to get the standard down in your head that what, whatever God says is sufficient. He said it, I believe it, all right? If you're going to go by the whims of society, it's going to be chaos because they're heading to be more and more heathen all the time. I mean, a lot of people either don't know or don't seem to care what God's Word says, okay? <laughs> God says, uh, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, okay? There are many things I can do, but that I do not do, precisely because it would be a hindrance to my, my witness. I would, I would drive some people off. There's a certain segment of the population that would not listen to me if I had long hair. They just wouldn't listen to me. They would automatically write me off as, hey, this guy is, you know, he's rebellious or whatever, okay? Um, so there's some things I could do, but I don't do purposely because I don't want to drive off. I don't want to drive off anybody because, you know, of my appearance. I don't mind driving them off because of my, what I teach, my doctrine, okay? That I don't, I don't mind. That's going to happen automatically, you know? But I do mind driving them off because of my appearance or because of my behavior. You know, can I drive 100 miles an hour down the road? Sure. Should I? No, I don't want to offend anybody. So, some things you can do that you shouldn't do. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. Okay, so, where's the standard for right and wrong? And I go into my seminar part one here about how so many teachers just blindly follow the textbooks. They never realize they can teach creation if they want. There has never been a law against teaching creation. Now, later on, much later on, we'll be getting into what can you do in a public school. But I'll give you just a quick synopsis here. Here's the basic history. American school system, and we'll have all this is in our one-room schoolhouse to opening up here pretty soon. American school system is pretty interesting. In the early days of the public school system in America, students were taught the Bible. They memorized Bible verses. They had preachers come in and preach. They had chapels in public schools for a hundred years. They had that, okay? Did you have preachers come preach at your school when you were in school, Diane? Yeah, I did. We read the Bible every morning over the PA system and then had prayer. Public school, Pleasant Hill Grade School, East Peoria, Illinois. Okay. Mid 60s, though, they kind of all just dropped all of a sudden when, you know, evolution hit the textbooks. We covered that uh, earlier. But so, they, nothing wrong with teaching creation in a public school. Never has been a law against it. In 1920s, evolution began to get into the curriculum more and more. And by 1925, I believe it was, Tennessee passed a law that said you cannot teach evolution in the schools. Several states were passing laws banning the teaching of evolution. Now, this was 1925, you know, the roaring 20s when everything's wild and loose and, you know, people are looking for a way to get rid of God, okay? And so several people said, hey, we've got to challenge this law. We have to stop this. And so the ACLU, the American Communist Lawyers Union, said, let's find somebody in Tennessee who's willing to challenge this law. It's called the Butler Act, B-U-T-L-E-R. Write that down. That'll be good. The Butler Act of Tennessee was passed in 1925, which said you cannot teach evolution. You cannot teach that humans have an ape ancestor. I forget the exact wording of the act. I've got it in my office, but they said you can't do that. Well, the problem is Tennessee had already voted in a biology textbook by Hunter that taught evolution. So here they got the legislators saying you can't teach evolution, but they voted in a textbook that says that teaches evolution. I've got the textbook in the library there, Jonathan, right by your desk. Have you seen that? 19, uh, 
was it 1911, I believe, was the time that book was written. It's one of the biology books that sit right behind the radio station by your desk there. But it's by Hunter. Now you look in there for a 1911 book, if you think of it, it'll bring that out. I'll show you sometime. <clears throat> but they taught evolution in the book, and Tennessee voted it in. Anyway, they advertised in the papers, would any teacher be willing to say he taught evolution so we can, you know, have a court case and get this law overturned? See, laws can be, can be overturned several different ways. The most common way is to get a court to rule uh, that it's unconstitutional. You can't do that. So somebody passes a law, you can't spit on the sidewalk, and you don't think that law is logical or reasonable, so when somebody's arrested for spitting on the sidewalk and they bring them in before the jury, and if you're on the jury, you have unbelievable power as a juror. There isn't probably one juror in 100,000 that knows what power he has. He has all the power over the law, over the court, over the judge. Over, he is in charge and doesn't even know it. They're never told that, that's for sure. So the guy's called in, he's going to be a juror, and the, they call up all the evidence that we, there's a law right here, statute number 4729 says you can't spit on the sidewalk. Here we got George here. Here's the videotape. Watch him, folks. Watch him spit on the sidewalk. Sure enough, he spits on the sidewalk. See, we caught him in the act. We've got it on videotape, and we got five witnesses, and they call in the witnesses and say, did George spit on the sidewalk? Yep, I saw him, and his time was, and they all agree, he's guilty. But you, as a juror, think the law is stupid. The question is not, did he spit on the sidewalk? I mean, it's obvious he spit on the sidewalk. The question is, is the law constitutional? So you, as a juror, can say, not guilty. Your not guilty vote, and of course, the rest of the jurors are going to say, what do you mean, not guilty? What? what? You know, and they're going to try to, you know, uh, berate you into voting their way, you know, because they want to go home. I don't want to deliberate on this for six days. Come on, let's go home. You know, why are you holding out on this? Because, guys, this is the purpose of a jury. We are judging not only whether he's guilty, we're judging whether the law is any good. And this law is no good. So I'm voting not guilty. Now, you can take as many re-votes as you want, but I'm not changing my mind. And they're eventually going to come back out, and the jury foreman is going to say, Your Honor, we find the defendant not guilty. And everybody's going to go, What? And you're all going to go home. The Butler Act, the ACLU wanted to do that. They wanted to get somebody convicted of teaching evolution because the law says you can't teach evolution. And then they wanted to make fun of Christians because of this. And they wanted to take this all the way to the Supreme Court and say, see, you can't teach evolution. Because keep in mind, in 1925, there wasn't much evolution in the textbooks. There wasn't much evolution at the university level even. But <clears throat> they were trying to get it into the schools, and sure enough, they did. And Tennessee said you can't teach evolution. So they had the court case, the famous Scopes Monkey Trial. John T. Scopes was a PE teacher. John T. Scopes, S-C-O-P-E-S. -E he, he answered the ad, and he met with some of the ACLU lawyers at the drugstore there in Dayton, Tennessee, a little sleepy town north of Knoxville, about 90 miles. And he said, guys, I'm a PE teacher, and I don't get into evolution at all in my class, but I did substitute one day for biology class because the teacher was gone or sick or something. So I was the substitute biology teacher, and we had a study hall. So we didn't teach any evolution, but I will claim that I did, if that will help you. And I think they paid him to be to do that. I don't remember what the deal was. I got the details in the office. But, um, they paid him to be the witness, you know. And so John T. Scopes uh, said, yep, I taught evolution, and they had a big court trial in Dayton, Tennessee. July 1925, boiling hot in the auditorium crammed with people from all over the country. All, people came from other countries, actually, to see this trial. <laughs> and the, they were worried the courthouse was going to collapse. It was so full of people. So they finally, and it was hot, boiling hot, so they finally met outside. This is days before air conditioning. You know, Tennessee is hot in July. So they met outside. They held court out there. And after 10 days of trial, the, the ACLU tried everything to bring in evidence for evolution. They wanted to bring in, you know, Piltdown Man and all the latest finds of evolution. And the judge says, well, no, forget it. None of the evidence for evolution is going to be allowed because that's not what's on trial. The question is, did he break the law? Simple. The law says you can't do it. Did he do it? And so finally he was found guilty of breaking the law. The teacher was John T. Scopes, the famous uh, uh, vice presidential candidate, uh, William Jennings Bryant, defended the, the law and the creationist position. Now, he did a lousy job on a couple of things. He did not take what's called the young earth creationist position. William Jennings Bryant said, I don't know how old the earth is. 
He said, the age of rocks doesn't concern me, the rock of ages concerns me. Well, that's a cute answer, but boy, oh boy, did that open the door for you know, them, them to make fun of him. And papers all over the country were carrying stories about this trial. I mean, it was up to the minute. You know, news wires going out all over the place. Oh, wow, here's how the trial's going in Dayton, Tennessee. They called it Monkey Town. The atheists and the ACLUs tried everything to make the Christians look bad. But the Christians in that town were very sweet and kind to the visitors coming in. It was just a, they were just treated them like royalty. Even the atheists, they're treated like royalty. But you can get a movie that shows in almost all the public schools today called Inherit the Wind. Has anybody ever seen or heard of that movie, Inherit the Wind? It shows almost every year in almost every public school. Some class will be showing that movie. The movie was made by, in Spencer Tracy's the main actor in the 1950s version. The whole purpose of the movie was to make fun of Christianity. There's an article on our website um, called, just type in Scopes, S-C-O-P-E-S, and it'll call up an eight-page article by a guy who did years of research on the differences between the movie and the real trial. Unbelievable thing. They changed all sorts of things. You know how Hollywood, if they're going to have a preacher in a movie, it'll be some wild-eyed, fanatical preacher holding an axe that's blood dripping off it because he just killed somebody. You know what I'm talking about? They do everything they can to make the Christians look bad. You know? <laughs> that's what they did with this movie, Inherit the Wind. And if they're going to show that movie at your, at your school, you better object to that. And you can make 100, 100 copies of that little eight-page article and pass it out to every kid. So the kids are going to say, wait, teacher, they're lying to us. This movie, this, they're lying. And they are. They're absolutely lying. But now, if you're an evolutionist and there is no God, how can something be a lie? You know, like Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? Well, he didn't know. Neither does Bill Clinton. Neither do many evolutionists. You know, what is truth? That's a good question, if evolution is a fact. How do you, how do you tell right from wrong on any topic? But anyway, that we'll cover more on this, what happened in the school system. But in 1925, the teacher was found guilty and fined 100 bucks for breaking the law. He did teach evolution. Here's your $100 fine. Well, that was uh, the minimum the law called for. The minimum fine was 100 bucks. So the judge said he gave him the minimum, 100 bucks. Now, there was a little technicality on how this was all done, and so they appealed it, and on appeal, the fine was overturned. He did not have to pay the fine. He was still found guilty of teaching evolution. And it remained illegal to teach evolution in many states until 1968. In 1968, the last law banning evolution was overturned by the court system, and so now it is okay to teach evolution. There has never been a trial on to say you cannot teach creation. That has never happened. Two states, Arkansas first in 1980, I believe, and then Louisiana in 1987, those two states passed laws requiring that creation be taught. Requiring. Big difference. The court said, no, 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 you cannot require creation be taught. We didn't say you couldn't teach it, we just said it can't be mandatory. There's a good impact article. By the way, if you don't get the impact articles, they're free from Institute for Creation Research. I would recommend you contact them on their website, icr.org, and say, hey, would you put me on your mailing list? And every month you get a new one of these. They're up to number 380 something now, I believe, one a month. So that's, you know, 380 months worth. They've been doing it since 1970s. They're 10 cents a piece, just little one page articles. They're powerful. You could order all of the back issues for like 38 bucks. Okay, and get a whole, I got them in the library if you want to come check ours out. But they cover every topic you can imagine. But this one, impact article number 196, was from October. I can't read the date there. Is that 1990? 1989, okay? October of 89, they have an article about, hey, you can teach creation. You can teach creation science in a classroom. Everybody's worried about, oh, the ACLU said you can't teach creation in the classroom. Yes, you can. But here's what happens. The ACLU has learned... All they have to do is threaten to sue a school, and the school will back down. Now, the fact is, they would lose the lawsuit. If they sued a teacher for teaching evolution, or for teaching creation, I'm sorry, they would lose. But see, the school principal looks at this and says, oh, no, a lawsuit from the ACLU is going to cost us millions of dollars to defend ourselves. So the principal is going to call in the teachers and say, look, you can't talk about creation because we are afraid of a lawsuit from the ACLU. Now the teacher's got a problem. The court says they can teach it, the law says they can teach it, the Bible says they should teach it, and now their boss says they can't. What are they going to do? They're probably not going to teach it. Now fortunately, many thousands of teachers go ahead anyway. 
They've learned what kids learn early in life. There's a lesson kids learn real early. Adults kind of forget it as they go along, but it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. <laughs> Don't ask, hey, can I teach creation? Don't ask, just do it, okay? <laughs> can I show Hovind's tapes in my class? Don't ask that, just do it. Plug in the tape and the kids are home saying, wow, guess what we learned in school today, you know? Dinosaurs lived with man, and then some dad's gonna call the teacher and say, what are you showing my kid, you know? Well, I didn't know there's anything wrong with it. You know, duh, duh, duh. what's the problem? And you can always respond with questions, you know, instead of, instead of real answers. Like Jesus responded with a question, you know, when they ask him, you know, is it lawful to pay Caesar? Oh, whose picture is on this? He's asking them a question back. You gotta learn to do that. It's called, uh, what's it, uh, demur, uh, traver traverse and demur. Somebody asks you a question, you respond with a question. Especially if it's a, a, a official, you know, trying to get you, you know, uh, nailed on something, you know. Oh, just, let me just respond with questions, you know. Uh, another long story, we'll get into that more later. Anyway, you should get these impact articles. Teachers can teach creation science in the classroom. Arkansas and Louisiana are the two states that pass laws requiring creation be taught and nobody caught on, hey guys, this is unnecessary. Suppose you passed a law in Florida that said teachers are required to breathe. And some teacher says, that's a dumb law. I'm going to sue the state for passing that law. Well, the courts would agree with you. You can't make a law that says you're required to breathe. Now, you probably ought to breathe, and you probably will if we leave you alone, okay? But <laughs> you can't say you're required to. And they didn't say you can't teach creation. They never said that. They just said you cannot be required to teach it. That's all. Stephen Gould, who's an evolutionist, he was, he's a creationist now because he died because he, he knows better, but he was an evolutionist at Harvard University. He hated creationists. Uh, I, I tried and tried to get him to you know, talk to me, or I tried to witness to him. I, I sent him my videotapes. I went up there to see him, and he was gone, but his secretary let me in his office and said, oh, there's my videotape sitting right behind his desk. So I hope he saw him. I don't know, but when he died with my tape sitting on his shelf in his library at Harvard University. But Stephen Gould said after the verdict from 19, uh, the court ruled that the Louisiana law is unconstitutional because the Louisiana law required they teach creation. Stephen Gould commented on that in the New York Times. He said, no statute exists in any state to bar instruction in creation science. It could be taught before, i.e. before this law was passed, and it can be taught now. Even he knew you can teach creation. Roger Baldwin is the founder of the ACLU, and he said very clearly, the purpose of the ACLU is the advancement of communism. Communism is the goal. That's why we're doing this. Every time you see a slide of mine that has a little asterisk, you look right under the picture, you see the asterisk down there? That means there's more information in the notes section. So if you get my slides, uh, you can, uh, if you get my PowerPoint presentation, I'll get it up here, we can read some of these notes uh, that I have down here. Uh, ACLU founder Roger Baldwin said, I am for socialism, disarmament, and ultimately for abolishing the state itself. I seek the social ownership of property, the abolition of property class, the sole control of those who produce wealth. Communism is the goal. ACLU started in 1920 by Roger Baldwin, the same year he went to the Soviet Union and he liked what he saw. He returned home and began incorporating its values into the agenda of his organization. In fact, in 1927, he wrote a book called Liberty Under the Soviets, extolling their atheistic, materialistic concept of life as the answer to America's problems. This is documented in the testimony of Earl Browder, former General Secretary of the Communist Party USA. He claimed the ACLU functioned as the transmission belt for his party. This is how we're going to get it done. So, I call it the American Communist Lawyers Union for a reason. I was speaking at uh, Pennsylvania, not the, the Junior College in Fort Walton. Okaloosa Walton Junior College, OW, Community College, OWCC. Oh, it's been years ago I was speaking there, Okaloosa Walton Junior College, and I'm a community college. I mentioned, you know, the ACLU, I called it the American Communist Lawyers Union, which I always do, okay? This one teacher was there. He got so angry during Q&A time, he was just screaming. His students were, this is our teacher. This guy's just lost control. He's gone bonkers. He came up and stood nose to nose with me that far away. And he's screaming. He said, how can you call these lawyers communists? I said, sir, obviously, you know, you're a little upset. You know, you need to study this out, okay? The whole purpose of the ACLU is the advancement of communism. That's their stated goal. 
Don't, don't yell at me. He was upset because I was hitting a nerve with him by striking down the evidence for evolution. Some people, when you start striking at evolution, they will get so angry at you because they know, hey, without evolution, they can't justify their wicked lifestyle. That's the purpose. I was at uh, Berkeley or one of the universities here. I've done so many debates. I debated professor number 99, uh, 93 debates, but I've had several, two or three on one. And it was, uh, I don't know if it was Berkeley or University of North Florida. But uh, I asked a student, he, afterwards, Q&A time, uh, we were out in the, in the lobby speaking, and he was just still angry over the debate, you know. He said, evolution's a fact. He's a great big old huge football player kind of guy. I said, well, son, let me ask you a question. Suppose I'm right. Suppose creation's true. Would that affect your lifestyle any? He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, suppose I'm right. I mean, if creation's true and the Bible's right, then God made the world and God makes the rules and... Uh, you know, no lying, no cheating, no adultery, no fornication, you know. Would that affect your lifestyle any? He said, you're trying to embarrass me. I said, I don't even know anything about you. I was asking, would that affect your lifestyle? He said, well, yeah, I would change everything. I said, so have you accepted this evolution theory because you really have evidence or because you like the freedom it gives you from rules? Got him right between the eyes. They've accepted this theory because of the freedom it gives them. And when you start attacking evolution, just get ready to have people hate you. You won't believe it. How many anti hoven websites now, Jonathan? Way over a thousand. They don't like me. I remember President, I think it was uh, uh, Reagan, called in his cabinet. His, you know, 12 cabinet members or 13, whatever he had back then. I don't know how many there are now. But one of the guys was getting blasted. Every local newspaper, every paper, every national paper had this guy headlines, you know, this guy's an idiot, look at this decision he made, you know, because he was making right decisions. And of course, the news media is going to hate you for that. And so he had this cabinet meeting and he flipped up all these newspaper articles. They're all mentioning this one guy, you know, I forget who it was now. And so look at this about this guy right here. Here's another article. Here's another newspaper article. He went through a whole bunch of them. He said, all of these papers and all of these articles and all these magazines are after this guy right here. He looked at the rest of the cabinet and he said, now what's wrong with the rest of you? <laughs> How come you're not stirring up trouble like this, you know? How come you don't have an anti, you know, website against you, you know? Look, if you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, guess which one yelps the loudest? The one that got hit, okay? And you can tell the ones that are yelping the loudest, oh, you hit a nerve there. So when I do the debates, I can tell which ones get, you know, when they get upset, ah, this is the one, we got them, yep. It's your lifestyle, isn't it? You like the freedom from, freedom from God. And so when you start blasting the ACLU, you're going to get the same results, okay? But that is the purpose. Now, I would have to say, many lawyers involved in the ACLU, ACLU, and there is a local chapter in Pensacola, okay? Many of them probably don't even know the history of their own organization, and they don't even know the hidden agenda or the not-so-hidden agenda of their organization. They think they're just defending civil liberties. Well, if, if you're in it and you believe that, you have been duped, okay? Come on, you're a lawyer. Figure it out, okay? <laughs> Think about it. Uh, American Communist Lawyers Union is what it is. Now, if a teacher gets up in front of their class and teaches the kids evolution, if they teach them, and millions do, if they say, kid, listen to me carefully, you started off like some kind of slime and you slowly evolved to a human, or quickly if you're from Harvard, okay? Any teacher that teaches that better stop and think for a minute. You, bet, you need to understand, what you're teaching is destroying the faith of some kid. You might have some kid in your class who believes the Bible, and you are destroying his faith. And, of course, the teachers might say, well, that's what I intend to do. Okay, that's fine. You can do whatever you want. But you better read what Jesus had to say about you. Matthew 18, 6. Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Anybody that teaches that junk is in serious trouble when they stand before God. James 3 said, My brethren, be not many masters, meaning teachers, knowing we shall receive the greater condemnation. I take what I do very seriously because of that verse. I speak over 900 times a year now on creation. See, today, um, one, two, it's only my third time today. Uh, but I speak 900 times a year. 
I teach a lot of people, so I take it very serious. I'm going to be judged severely because what I teach influences other people. I try very hard to be right. I study, I read, I, I mean, I want to be right. Not because I want to say I'm right, because I'm going to answer to God someday. You know, the Bible says, to whom much is given, much required. God gave us in America freedom. I mean, you could have been in China, you know, or Soviet Union, or you could have been born in some country where it's, you know, 90% Muslim and they enslave the Christians. They actually put chains on them and enslave them. There's probably more slavery now than there was when, you know, Columbus sailed across the ocean or when America uh, set the Negroes free. There's slavery, in, like, it's unbelievable slavery ha happening right now in Muslim countries. The Muslims have a slogan they use. They say, when you're in a country and if you're in the minority, you know, just be nice, be sweet, be kind, you know, and have lots of kids. We're going to take over this country by outpopulating the world. And they do, eight or nine kids per family. Their slogan is, if you're in the minority, you're a lamb. If you're in the majority, you're a lion. And that's the way they do it. You can go to any country with a Muslim majority and watch what happens to freedoms of anybody else who's non-Muslim. So I'm not anti-Muslim. I'm for truth and against error. Okay, we'll get into more on Muslims on seminar part seven in about nine years at the rate we're going here. Okay, here's the story. In the 1950s, the average textbook in America had very little evolution. It just really wasn't talked about much. I remember going to school. I was born in 53, January 53, but I remember, you know, evolution. What is that? Never heard of it, you know. In 1957, by the way, educational research analysts, this is uh, Mel Gabler's organization in Longview, Texas. Great organization if you want to study textbooks. Their website is textbookreviews. Dot, is it org or com, Jonathan? Do you remember? Textbookreviews.com. Dot com. Try both. Textbook reviews. Mel, Mel Gabler died a few months ago at age, what, 86. His wife, Norma, still alive, and they've, the organization's still doing great. But uh, he started 40-some years ago when his son brought home a textbook, and it had just a serious mistake in it. You know, like Abe Lincoln was George Washington's vice president or something like that. He said, what? What? And he began reading the book and found all kinds of mistakes. And so they just, he and his wife just, you know, over the next, I don't know how long it took them to get full time, but they devoted their entire life to reviewing textbooks, finding mistakes. Unbelievable mistakes. One of them had the equator going through Florida. And I saw the picture of it. So, you know, dumb stuff. Historical goofs that are just incredible. And they have a review of almost every textbook written in the last 40 years. You can, they work on a donation basis, you know, send them 50 bucks or 100 bucks and say, hey, look, send me the review of this textbook and they'll give it to you. They'll probably do it for free. They would do it for free, but send them something. Uh, the textbook reviews got started back 42 years ago, whatever, uh, about the time evolution became a popular theory because they found all kinds of mistakes. Not only did they find mistakes, they found just bold-faced lies that are being used to support the evolution theory. And they're still one of the, one, probably the organization that textbook publishers fear most. They are scared stiff of this Mel Gabler's organization, the Educational Research Analyst. This is, these are his numbers. Okay, after reviewing thousands of textbooks, how many words are devoted to evolution in each textbook? In the 1950s, almost nothing, a couple thousand words. 1957, the Russians beat us in the space race by launching Sputnik. You guys probably old enough to remember that when Americans panicked. The Russians are ahead in the space race. Wow, there's going to be nuclear war. The sky is falling. I mean, Life magazine ran articles, how you can survive fallout. In case of a nuclear war, how you can survive. They, they said the Soviets are ahead of us in science because they're teaching evolution. What does evolution have to do with putting up a satellite? What does evolution have to do with any scientific advancement? I've asked people all over, can you name one scientific advancement we have because it is evolution theory? Just name one. Never had anybody name one. They say, well, modern medicine would fall apart without evolution. Oh, you're a bunch, that's a bunch of baloney. There isn't a doctor on the planet that cares about evolution while he's operating on somebody. Quite the opposite. I mean, when he cuts them open, he expects to know generally where the appendix is. You know, it's pretty much the same on everybody, right? <laughs> wow, his appendix is up by his left ear. What happened here? He must be evolving. No, it's always going to be halfway from the ilium to the belly button. You're right in that neighborhood somewhere, okay? It's always going to be there. So they said, you can survive fallout. 
and people built bomb shelters. There were articles in magazines, how to build a bomb shelter. I remember distinctly as about a 10-year-old kid, my dad sitting down with the whole family discussing the possibility of nuclear war, 1963, 62, 63 in there. He said, kids, there's a possibility, you know, we're going to have nuclear war. The Soviets are so far ahead of us in science, and we may have to build a bomb shelter. And my dad was quite the builder, always building stuff. We built several houses, my family, my kids and I, and dad, dad and the kids together. And uh, we, we had serious plans to build a bomb shelter in East Peoria, Illinois. And probably several hundred people in our city did. And they stocked it with fresh water supplies and fresh food and, you know, batteries and flashlights. I mean, they had a whole list in the paper. Don't forget to bring this and this and this. And, you know, it was incredible. It was, it was scare, scary because people were scared, oh, wow, the Soviets are ahead in science. And the excuse was they're ahead because they teach evolution. In 1959, it was the 100-year anniversary of Darwin's book being published. Now, I have said in my previous seminars, and I found out it's wrong, okay, so I'm going to correct it here right now. They did not publish a 1959 anniversary edition that we can find. If you can find one, let me know. But I have said in the 100-year anniversary edition of Darwin's book, you know, Arthur Keith said blah, blah, blah. That is not correct. It's true Arthur Keith said that, but it's not true he said it there, okay? Apparently, nobody's been able to find a 100-year anniversary edition of Darwin's book. But it was the 100th anniversary of Darwin's book. So the, but there wasn't an edition published then, as far as anybody can find. But in 1959, President Eisenhower asked Congress for a billion dollars for the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, New American Education Fund, for the promotion and publication of the new science of evolution. Ten and a half million dollars was given to the National Science Foundation for the new nine-part theme curriculum teaching evolution. The NSF provided the Biological Sciences Curriculum Study, BSCS. And it was full of BS, I can assure you. I have one of the books in our library if you want to come and look in the science books in there in the early 60s. And by the way, the BSCS, I don't know if they're still publishing this year, but for years they published textbooks on evolution. Uh, on biology that were consistently the most um, packed with evolution. No other books that I have in my library have more evolution than the BSCS series, okay? Biological Sciences Curriculum Study. They, they used the money to provide textbooks to public schools. They called it the Cold War Reconstruction of American Science Education. If you want to get more on this topic of what happened in the 1959, 60, 61, 62 era, you can call Bob Fry, frysci at aol.com. Bob Fry lives in uh, Minnesota, near uh, Minneapolis. He's a good friend of mine, and he speaks on creation. And he, his field of expertise, like I speak on dinosaurs and creation, he just focuses in on education and is really, really knowledgeable on the subject. So tell Bob I said hi. But uh, frysci at aol.com, you can get a hold of Mr. Fry and say, because he's one sent me this information in this book right here. So there's plenty of other people who speak on this topic, but what happened? They began really pushing evolution into the schools with this new grant money. And just about the whole U.S. curriculum was rewritten in the early 60s. By 1963, there were 33,000 words about evolution in the average textbook. Evolution became the state religion. Now, it dropped off after that, not because there was less evolution, but because there was less textbook. The kids were being dumbed down for whatever reason, part of the plan toward a new world order, I'm sure. But so the percentage of evolution in the textbook remained consistently high since 63. In 1963, Madeline Murray O'Hare pushed real hard to get prayer taken out of our schools, and she got it. This was an amazing story. You ought to read this story by her son, William Murray, who wrote the illegitimate son, William Murray. He's an evangelist, travels around, preaches. Uh, he wrote a book called My Life Without God. You should read his life story, uh, what it was like growing up as the son of Madeline Murray O'Hare. Okay? And he now is as an evangelist. <laughs> of course, his mom died a couple years ago, but she was she drove him nuts, drove her nuts, you know, that her son became an evangelist. What happened was he was going to school in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. In ninth grade, the mother had wanted to go be a Soviet citizen. She hated America. She was a communist. She was an atheist. And they just weren't friendly to atheists over here. So she's going to go to the Soviet Union. So she applied for Soviet citizenship. She actually moved her and the two illegitimate kids she had to France, waiting for, you know, can, you, can I come into Russia? I want to be a Russian. I want to be a Soviet. 
They wrote her back and said, we have reviewed your history of your jobs, and you've had quite a few jobs, most of which you have been fired from or have, you know, got mad at the boss and quit. You don't have a good work record, and you don't understand. Soviet Union, you know, you don't work over here, you don't eat. Uh, so we don't think you would fit in here, and no, your Soviet citizenship is denied. <laughs> Madeline Murray O'Hare. She came back to Baltimore, and she's all upset, you know, and she's mad and mad at the world and mad at, she's spent her whole life mad at everybody. And uh, her son is in ninth grade now at this high school in Baltimore. She was late bringing him to class, and she walked in the school, you know, a few minutes late to bring her son to class one day, and she heard them saying the Pledge of Allegiance over the PA system. I pledge allegiance to the flag, you know, one nation under God. And she said, do they say that every day here? He said, oh, yes, Mom, wait till you see what's coming next. And after the pledge, guess what? They had prayer over the PA system in the school. And she hit the ceiling, all 300 pounds of her. She was so angry. She went in and screamed and yelled at the principal, I don't want my son to pray in school. He's an atheist. Well, so the school said, well, ma'am, he's welcome to go out in the hallway. Nobody's required to pray here. It's fine. You can go out in the hallway. And so she sued the school for teaching, uh, uh, for, teaching uh, for, for allowing prayer. And she lost. The court threw it out said, this is stupid. She appealed it, went to the appellate level. She lost again. She went to the state Supreme Court. She lost again. She went to the federal appellate court, I believe was the sequence. She lost again. She went to the Supreme Court and won. And prayer was taken out of our schools because of that lady's efforts right there. Now, there's a guy that lives in Mobile, Alabama that works at a church over there. It's a friend of mine. He's been over here many times at Einstein Adventureland. He worked for Madeline Murray O'Hare in Texas at her atheist organization as a lawn keeper. And he carved her a special walking stick because she had back trouble and had all, she had heart trouble, mostly uh, head trouble, a lot of it. But he carved her a walking stick so she could walk around with this cane. She never knew it, but he had made the top where it would unscrew and inside he hollowed it out and it was a miniature version of the Bible inside there. She walked around with this cane with a miniature version of the Bible in her hand for years. <laughs> never knew it. Claiming atheism, God, you know, there is no God. <laughs> it's pretty, just a little bit of trivia to throw in there. But anyway, Madeline Murray O'Hare, by 1962 or three, had prayer taken out of our schools. In 1963, we saw incredible problems come into the moral system of the world. We'll talk about that. We'll get back from a five-minute break. What happened since 1963? Let's take up where we left off here uh, before the break about uh, what's happened since 1963. These are what we're going to cover now is what's called a moral indicator. How do you tell if a country is having trouble? Well, you can look at your own personal bank account and see some in indicators that, wow, I'm in trouble. You know, the balance keeps dropping every month. Or, you know, my outgo exceeds my income. Or, you know, there are indicators that you're, you're going to have trouble if you don't do something to stop it. There are some moral indicators you can look at to say, wow, what's happening? We're going to have some problems here if we don't put a stop to this. Since 1963, the percentage of teenage girls having sex before marriage has grown incredibly. Okay? Not realizing, see, they're following Hollywood's lie that, oh, you're missing out on all the fun. This, I had this pressure when I was a kid, you know, all my buddies in school are talking about all the girls they've been with, you know, and are all bragging in the locker room. Well, I said, look, I'm just going to save myself for marriage. And you know, it's interesting. I went for my 30th high school reunion a couple of years ago, and all the guys that were bragging about all the women they had are now divorced three times and paying alimony all over the country. And I've been married 32 wonderful years and got a gorgeous wife and my kids live right next to me and all my grandkids come visit grandpa all the time and I'll take what I've got over what they've got any day. Just don't listen to Hollywood. They don't have a clue. But what happened, once you start teaching kids in the early 60s, hey, we are, we're just an animal, we evolved from an animal. Well, what do you expect? Now, there may be several other things involved in the, this great rise, okay? I'm not saying evolution is the only cause of it, but the teaching of evolution certainly is a major cause of what we're about to show you. Some people have argued, well, that's when color television became popular. Okay, well, you want to blame color TV for this? I suppose you can, but I don't know, okay. Some people say that's when the birth control pill came out. Ah, uh, now there you might be onto something. Okay, maybe the birth control pill does have a factor because people think, well, hey, we can have sex if I get, you know, I won't get pregnant because I got this pill to take, okay? Maybe that was it. 1963, though, was when we also saw a great rise in sexually transmitted diseases. Now this is for 10 to 14 year old kids. 1963, we saw a great rise in unwed birth rates. Again, for 10 to 14 year olds, there's been a 550% increase in pregnancies. Why the different numbers? 
Well, the 100% is the increase in actual live birth rates. The 500% is the pregnancy, so the difference there are those being aborted. California right now is trying to pass a law that says parents of minor children have to be notified if their girl's going to go have an abortion, which is obviously wonderful, but think how stupid it is to not have it that way. I mean, your 12-year-old your girl can't take an aspirin at school without parents' permission, but she can go get an abortion, which is life-threatening. <laughs> can we possibly be that stupid in this country <laughs> to allow such a thing? The number of uh, out-of-wedlock births, illegitimate children, fatherless, you know, uh, raised in a fatherless home, has increased incredibly. Now, over a third of all the kids born at the hospital are born to a couple not married. In the black community, it's close to 60%. 60% of the kids are were born in the hospital and the parents aren't married. Well, you say, big deal. Oh, it is a big deal. Kids who are brought up in fatherless homes account for 53% of the teen mothers. I mean, it seems to go on to the next generation, okay? 63% of youth suicides, kids who kill themselves, are from illegitimate children. 71% of high school dropouts, 85% of youths in prison, and 90% of homeless or runaway children come from these fatherless homes. It makes a giant difference. You have to have a dad in the house, the biological dad in the house. Now, kids that are raised without their biological mother and father can still turn out and serve God in incredible ways, okay? But the odds are against it. See, God says He will become the father to the fatherless. That's a powerful verse. I know many kids that were orphaned or whatever, or dad left the family or whatever, they claim that as their verse. God, I didn't have a father, and I want you to be my father. Says, I'll become the father to the fatherless. Now, I had an awesome father who was, really took us kids seriously and taught us everything, okay? But not everybody has that. I understand. My dad was a far cry from perfect, that's for sure, but he was just a really godly man, loved the Lord, loved his kids, wanted to do right, you know? Timothy was a half-breed who never should have been born. See, the Jews were commanded, only marry Jews. Well, you can read Timothy's history. His mother was a Jew and his father was a Greek. Well, guess what that means? Mama disobeyed, okay? She didn't obey God's law. She got married to a Greek. Nothing wrong with Greeks, but the Jews weren't supposed to marry anybody non-Jewish, period. And Timothy is the result. Well, he wrote two books in the Bible and was a great man of God. So if your parents messed up, I tell people, look, Shut your mouth, quit your whining, and you go serve God with your life, okay? There are no excuses. You can't say, well, my dad left the family, so therefore, you know, I'm going to be a bum too. <laughs> you numbskull. You can go serve God. with. <laughs> just go do something for God with your life. There's been a 725% increase in unmarried couples living together. I remember as a kid, if you heard of anybody living together, not married, it was like, oh, that's terrible. Now, she whiz. It's all over the place. God's word has not changed. Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is one of the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions, by the way, okay? He said, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. God, see, just like the taking of human life is very serious in just about every culture. I mean, if you murder somebody, you're in trouble, right? In just about every culture. The giving of life is very serious. In God's economy, giving, starting another human life is a very serious thing. He, it's like if I handed you know, a 10-year-old kid an M16 and said, here, kid, I want you to carry this for me. It's loaded, ready to fire. I would say, now, here's the rules. Don't point it at anybody, okay, unless you intend to kill them. Okay? In the Marines, I'm sure you got that. Don't point it at them unless you're going to shoot them or intend to kill them. Well, God gave us the ability to produce eternal souls. I mean, sex is not just a recreational sport. I mean, it's, it's incredibly powerfully important. It's not just as a bonding agent for a family. That's the problem with these guys sleeping with everybody else. They're not going to have any bonding with their wife. They're not going to have a good wife, not, not going to have a good marriage. Their wife can't trust them. They can't trust themselves. So I don't understand the people, you know, that uh, sleep around with everybody else. I, don't, I didn't do that, and I, I don't understand those that do. But I know this. I'll take what I've got. After 32 years of marriage to the same woman, I'll take that any day over what they've got. All they're bragging in high school, now they're not bragging. 
Now they're hurting every month when they pay that alimony check, okay? God, God said, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge, Hebrews 13. By the way, that same passage says, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Matthew 5, Jesus said, I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Not just actual adultery, but even looking and lusting. And I say in my seminar, look, ladies, that's why it's important how you dress. God designed the system pretty simple. The man looks at the woman's body, gets excited, and that causes the whole process of starting making children, okay? <laughs> That's the way it works. I mean, it works that way in all the animal kingdom, too. So, if you're not in business, don't advertise, all right? And I don't know, here we are in Pensacola, you know. You go down to the beach and it's bear season all year long out there. Well, just because there's water and sand doesn't mean you can take off most of your clothes, okay? I don't understand. Well, I'm at the beach. Lady, you got less on than you do for underwear normally. I mean, if you were walking down the mall like this, you'd be embarrassed. But now there's water and sand, and you're not embarrassed. <laughs> Are you dumb in any other area? You know? Well, I just want to attract them. Well, you're attracting them all right, but it's not the kind of attention you want. And see, those women that attract people with their body, what are they going to do when they don't have a good body? What are they going to do when they're sick? What are they going to do when they're old? The husband's going to leave them for somebody else. So if you attract them with your body, well, then you're going to lose them when you don't have that body. Attract them with your Christian spirit, okay? You love them for what, who they are, the real person, okay? That's another long story. Divorce rates have gone absolutely nuts in our country until the early 80s when it began to drop off. Well, why did it drop off? Because they just weren't getting married. Therefore, you don't need a divorce. I remember the slogan, they say, we know the cause of divorce, it's marriage. <laughs> well, duh. <laughs> so therefore, don't get married. You know, average in America, average length of marriages in America now is 7.2 years, as of 1998, a couple years ago. 50% of first marriages end in divorce. 68% of second marriages end in divorce. The grass is not greener on the other side of the fence, guys. It's artificial turf, okay? Or they have a huge water bill. It's just not greener. Keep that first wife and just work out the problems, all right? Jonathan getting married in 31 days, okay? Just say this is it. 30 days, okay. For better or for worse. My daughter and I talked yesterday. I said she's been married five years now. And Paul, they've, he said uh, cancer, had just incredible expenses. You know, they've been to the chemo, the, the bill they had at the hospital, MD Anderson Hospital, was a uh, hundred and some thousand dollars. You know, on Rio for one month, you know, um, 20,000 in Mexico to get the laetrile treatments. And they're going back again Monday for more laetrile treatments in Mexico. Just I mean, not only no work for four months, but incredible bills, okay? I said, well, Marlissa, I remember, you know, I led you in the vows myself, and you said, for better, for worse. She said, yeah, I sure did, Dad. We've had some of the worst. I said, yeah, everybody gets that. My wife and I lost our first three kids. We've got six kids, three in here, three here, and three in heaven. We know about the better or worse stuff, okay? Uh, some people have it worse than that, believe me, okay? But that's why people look at marriage as just, you know, oh, I don't like that one, I'll get another one. We've lost our Christian principles in, in many areas, and this divorce rates is a moral indicator that we're losing something in our country. I mean, back in the you know, early, part of, early part of the century, man, you get married, you, that's it. There's just no question. You're stuck for life. They asked Mrs. Rice. John R. Rice was a great preacher, you know. His brother Bill Rice started the Bill Rice Ranch, and John R. Rice uh, wrote many, many books, had six daughters. Uh, great, great preacher years ago. They asked Mrs. Rice. They said, Mrs. Rice, did you ever think about divorce? She'd been married like 60 years. She was at a woman's conference, and Mrs. Rice said, Divorce? No, I never thought about that. I thought about murder a couple times, but never thought about divorce. That was her answer. I can understand that too, real well, okay. Um, child abuse since 1963 has increased 2,300% since evolution became a popular theory. After all, if kids are just animals and parents are just animals and the animal kingdom, I mean, sometimes, you know, animals abuse their children or kill them. Hamsters, the daddy hamster, I used to raise hamsters, man, you get the dad in there by mistake, he'll eat the babies. His own babies, he'll eat them. So, 
Uh, grizzly bears, they'll kill babies, you know. Child abuse has increased. Is, it, is, is there any connection here between teaching them evolution and child abuse? I think there is, okay? <laughs> Illegal drug use has increased 6,000%. Now, maybe that's because there weren't as many illegal drugs to use back then. That could certainly could be a factor. But I think a factor that enters into this is a kid's thinking of, hey, there is no God, so I get to decide what's right and wrong, so hey, if it feels good, do it. Thomas Huxley, you might want to write that name down, Thomas Huxley, H-U-X-L-E-Y. When Darwin's book came out, Darwin kind of wrote the book, published it, and kind of went and hid, you know, in his house because he knew it was going to raise a uh, stink. Thomas Huxley is known as Darwin's Bulldog. That was his nickname, Darwin's Bulldog. Huxley would go around debating and, you know, speaking on evolution, what a wonderful theory this is, and everybody ought to believe it. It's a fact. They called him uh, Darwin's Bulldog. Thomas Huxley's two grandsons are pretty famous. You might want to write these names down. Aldous Huxley and... Julius Huxley. There's grandsons. One of them became the founder of UNESCO, the United Nations, uh, what is it, Sex Education Council, okay? And another one became famous for the really starting the whole drug culture in America. He's the one who told his students, you should take LSD. This stuff will enlarge your mind. He got his students taking LSD in uh, early 60s, 62, 63, because, oh, it'll make you just, make you so en enlightened, you know. <laughs> yeah, same lie that Satan used to Eve. Eve, eat off this tree, and ye shall be as gods. What's the rest of that? Good Knowing good and evil. You get to know some new stuff if you eat off that tree. You take these drugs, and wow, you get this whole new experience, you know. Well, look what's happened in our country because of this drug culture. I asked a police officer a couple weeks ago, I was speaking in Pennsylvania last week, and he's a police officer in Washington, D.C. I said, how many of the crimes that you have to work with are related to drugs or alcohol? He said, oh, man, 90%? Drugs or alcohol? People just want to, you know, get that biological high uh, and it doesn't matter what it costs. And of course, any drug person will tell you, you know, you take them and you get that high, oh, wow, I feel good, and then next time you got to take a little bit more next time. And pretty soon it's a little more, and pretty soon you can't get enough. Pretty soon you can't get the high, you just got to take the drugs just to not get the low. How many have ever heard of Teen Challenge? You know, Nikki Cruz and uh, uh, the book Run Baby Run, uh, and uh, Wilkins, James Wilkerson, James Wilkerson, Wilkerson, what's his name? David Wilkerson, yeah. I read all those books as a kid. Great, great story about, you know, the drugs were just so popular and just destroyed lives. A lot of these drugs were developed, by the way, in the 50s and 60s to be used as biological uh, warfare against the enemy or to get soldiers that could go 24 hours a day. Give them drugs, they could be super soldiers and fight like mad all day long. Adolf Hitler took heroin, I believe it was, on a regular basis. Or speed, speed. Hitler would say, before the doctor could get the needle out of the arm, I felt the surge of energy. And Hitler just worked, you know, relentlessly. I mean, no, none of his staff could keep up with him. The book I just read a few weeks ago called The Pink Swastika, we ordered a case to put in the library here, is about how Hitler's uh, SS troops were 90% gay, queer, homosexual. 90%. I often want, I read lots about Hitler and the Holocaust, okay? I read lots, I've been over there a couple of times. I just love reading about Hitler, watch every movie I can find on Hitler and the Holocaust because I think it ties directly into evolution, and we'll get into more of that later. But I wondered, how can these people be so cruel? I mean, it's one thing to think, I'm a superior race, and you're an inferior, and I'm going to kill you, you know, bang. But it wasn't like that. They were just cruel, beyond reason. I mean, if you're going to kill a chicken to eat it, don't be cruel to it, you know, don't pluck one feather at a time. Go ahead and kill it and then pluck the feathers and eat the thing. Okay, cook it and eat it. But when you, when you realize how this ties into not only evolution that Hitler believed and his troops believed, but into homosexuality, now it's like, wow. See, read Romans chapter 1. They refused to accept God. They didn't want to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them up. And then it descends right to homosexuality. Romans chapter 1. Just read through that chapter and you'll see it's just a steady line, a direct line, straight from evolution believing and rejecting the Creator into accepting homosexuality. They said uh, one of Hitler's uh, 
Gaius was all upset. He said, a million men in our army are gay, or queer, as they called them back then, homosexual. By the way, in that book, Hitler's uh, The Pink Swastika, it tells what happened. There was a group of people that started, there are two kinds of queers in Germany. Uh, one was called the Butches, the masculine, macho, beat up everybody kind of guy. And the other were called the Femmes, you know, the, hi, what's your name, you know. The Butches and the Femmes, okay. About 20% of the gay people were Femmes. And about 80% were the Butches, they called them, okay. Uh, well, the Femmes had been, had an uh, institution started, called, it is in German, I forget the big long name for it, but something basically the Sexual Disorientation Institute or something. Anybody with sexual problems, you know, they would keep records and try to help them. It started in 1920. Well, they had all kinds of records on almost all of these, you know, Hitler's big, big wigs, okay? And so four days after Hitler came to power in Germany in 1933, which by the way was done with uh, Roosevelt's money, uh, it, was, it was rich people here in America that funded the rise of Hitler, okay? That's another long story, 1933 out. Hitler had, had the money to come to power because of American help. Hitler was, in 1938, I believe, Time Magazine's Man of the Year. Joseph Stalin was on Time Magazine twice as Man of the Year in, those, in that era. 19, I'd like to get a copy of those, by the way. If anybody can get me a copy of that, those magazines, just a picture, you know, showing Time Magazine having Hitler as Man of the Year. <laughs> I bet that magazine's hard. We need that for our science center, right? This next room out here, the museum about the dangers of evolution. So if you can get Stalin or Hitler, the Time magazine, an old one, please send it to me. Uh, but how did I get off on all that? Uh, Hitler taking drugs, uh, Hitler, uh, guys being a homosexual, queer. Uh, and I guess I don't mean that in a derogatory term. That's the term I was raised with. You know, they're queer. And that's the term they still call themselves, you know, queer nation. But they talk about the butches and the femmes. Hitler came to power four days later his guards and his uh, soldiers stormed this sexual institute place and stole all the records, which was all the records on them. And then three days after that, they had a book burning. And you see all the movies of Hitler burning books. You know, that's the books they were burning. The evidence against themselves. <laughs> Better read that book, The Pink Swastika. It's in our, it should be in our bookstore by now. Since 1963, we've seen an incredible rise in violent crimes. I can remember as a kid, growing up in East Peoria, Illinois, we never locked our house. I never had a key to my house. We'd go off on vacation for two weeks and would we'll lock it. Man, why? I remember my dad taking a short piece of little chain and uh, taking the pliers and attaching the chain to the key to the ignition to the car. And on the other end of the chain, he put a screw into the dash of the car so you could not take the key out of the car because you might lose it. Not only did you leave him in the car all the time, you couldn't take it out. And nobody stole cars back in those days. Well, some did. I mean, was, there's nothing like today. Today you've got to have security systems and all kinds of stuff, you know. And it's just, do you guys remember the days when you didn't have to lock your house? I mean, what's happened to our country? Some of you young kids say, what? Of course you lock your house. That's normal, you know. It hasn't always been this way. Violent crimes increased nearly a thousand percent. I remember you'd go to the high school, an average, average high school would have a loaded rifle, or the, pick, the pickups in the parking lot would have loaded, loaded rifles in the backyard, I mean in the back window. I was just in Wyoming uh, yesterday, and uh, they said, oh yeah, that was common back, you know, 30 years ago. Every kid brought his pickup truck to school. And Loaded rifles in the back, and they're, they're going to go hunting after school. Of course, you got your rifle with you. Nobody got shot in school. Columbine High School was just one of 20 shootings we've had in the last few years in America. I've got a list of all of the shootings, how many were killed. Over 230 students have been killed in public schools. I went to Jonesboro, Arkansas, to the prison there, and visited the two boys who shot everybody in Jonesboro. I sat and talked with them for hours. The nine-year-old kid, I don't think, has a clue. He's just, to him, it's just a video game, you know? Something moves, bam, shoot it. You know? The 12-year-old or 13-year-old, whatever he was, uh, it's gonna, when he gets out at age 18, they're gonna let him out, they can't keep him. And uh, he's probably out, right? This has been like five years ago, so he's probably getting close to getting out. But he said, man, I'm sorry. I said, it was wrong, it was wrong, you know? I'm sorry, and uh, when I get out, I want to go be a preacher. I want to try to do some good for the world. So. But I'm concerned about what happens in our schools. My PhD is in education. I'm concerned what's going on. The Calvary Chapel I spoke at in Denver, the pastor at the church, the Calvary Chapel there, was one of the first people on the scene 
when they got to Calvin Mind Sharing. We talked about it for a long time when I spoke at his church out there. He had several of his students that were injured by this. I think one of them was killed, one of the kids in his church. Several were wounded. What caused the shooting at Columbine High School? Well, one of the students, uh, there were Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. Uh, Klebold's father was a geologist who believed in evolution, so this is what I'm sure he was taught, I would assume. They were both followers of Nazi teaching. This is interesting. The shooting took place on Hitler's birthday. They planned it for months. We're going to go in on Hitler's birthday as a, as a, you know, uh, as an honorarium to our Führer. They wore a uh, t-shirt that said serial killer, Cleveland did. Now, Eric's t-shirt said natural selection. Where did you get that? Huh? Um, they went up to Cassie and Rachel and said, are you a Christian? Yes. Bam. Shot him in the face. Hated Christianity. And right after the shooting, Rosie O'Donnell got on her program. By the way, there's a, uh, a videotape out by uh, Phyllis Schlafly's organization, Eagle Forum. Okay? Go to eagleforum, F-O-R-U-M, dot org, I think it is. They've got a videotape, but look for the one called Death Education. Columbine High School was one of the first schools to implement death education as one of their classes. To teach the, the kids have to write out their own obituary. What do you want the paper to say when you die? You got to think about death all the time. Let's go visit a funeral hall. Let's go visit a, a, a you know some graves and see look at the tombstones. And not that that's necessarily wrong, but it was interesting. They really emphasized the importance of death. Death education, they call it. This is the video by uh, the Eagle Forum. It's called Death Education, I believe, or something like that. Angels of Death. No, death Education. You can check them out. But anyway. They certainly were taught all kinds of strange things, and the boys were on some kind of drugs, too. Ridland does all kinds of strange things. If your kid's on Ridland, man, get a hold of Bill Sardi's website, BillSardi.com, S-A-R-D-I, and just see what Ridland and all these drugs are doing to these kids. Here's the problem. If a kid is hyperactive in school, the school puts them on drugs, or the doctor says, put this kid on a drug to calm him down. Here's what people don't realize. That because this kid is now a special, classified as a special kid, the school gets more money. It goes right back to love of money, root of all evil. So they encourage parents, hey, your kid's kind of hyper, why don't you take him and get him some Ridland or something, you know? Secretly, it's why we're hoping to get more funding for our school, you know, we need a new gymnasium. Love of money, root of all evil. And so the kids around some of these drugs and stuff like that, some of them are antidepressants, which just make you go bonkers in your thinking, okay? There's a long, long story behind that one. Uh, right after the shooting, Rosie O'Donnell came on TV on her program and said, see, we need more gun control. Rosie, those kids broke 18 gun laws going into that school. Two more gun laws would not have slowed them down. Rosie cannot figure it out. But one guy figured it out, put it on the tire cover in his van. I saw that, I said, I've got to get a picture of this. This explains everything. He said, Blaming guns for Columbine is like blaming spoons for Rosie O'Donnell being fat. <laughs> this is classic. It's not the spoon's fault, Rosie, okay? And it's not the gun's fault either, okay? See, guns don't kill people. People kill people. And we don't need gun control. We need criminal control. They got it so backwards. They think you're going to stop crime with gun control. Then the only people that have guns are the criminals. All right. Well, duh. I like to give the analogy. You know, you walk into a bank and you're standing there going to do your business, and some guy walks in and pulls out a gun. Everybody lay on the floor. Everybody lays on the floor. Now, imagine you're in Texas. You walk into the bank. Just about everybody there's armed. You know, they keep it hidden. You know, or some state where they allow you to carry, you know, concealed weapons and. Uh, some guy pulls out a gun, everybody lay on the floor. Pretty soon, 44 guns pointed in. Uh, no, sir, you lay on the floor. Oh, well, we kick the snot out of you, okay? I believe everybody should be armed. That's how you control the criminals. The police can't protect you. I got a book in the library called Call 911 and Die. <laughs> if, if the people aren't defending themselves, it's going to fall apart. I didn't teach my kids to shoot till they were about three. I probably waited too long to start to do it now. You know? By the time they're three, they need to learn, look, this is the gun, here's the end, the bullet comes out of it. You know, here's how you make it work, and uh, 
if you touch it, I'm going to spank you, you know, uh, without me telling you, go ahead and touch it. But I, I wanted to know. And I never told my kids, hey, pretend like it's loaded. It's loaded, man. An unloaded gun is a club. If I pick it up, I want a gun, not a club, okay? <laughs> fire, fire, loaded, ready to fire. Oh, you got to put the safety off. Pick it up, put the safety, bam. I mean, I don't, I've never shot anybody. I hope I never have to. But it's, it's a, one of those decisions you have to make when you're cool, calm, and collected. If somebody breaks in my house to harm my family, I'm going to shoot them. Not because I hate them, but because I love my family. It's just a decision you make when you call. You got to do that. And some people disagree. My dad was in the Marines in World War II, and as probably a seven or eight year old, we started going to the uh, Mennonite Church in East Peoria. And we went there for, until I was about 12, to the Mennonite Church. Of course, they're pacifists, you know, don't fight. Don't get involved in the war. Um, don't, don't resist evil, you know, don't fight for any other sheep, etc. And they kind of gave my dad a hard time for being, hey, you were in the World War II, you know, you're an ex Marine, and then, you know. So we finally left the church, went to a Methodist church, out of the frying pan into the fire. But uh, that's another long story. But uh, the idea of, you know, not defending yourselves, I don't see that in Scripture. There are two kinds of wars there's wars of aggression, where you go try to take somebody's stuff away, okay? Those are wrong. But when you're defending yourself from the aggressor, those are perfectly right, perfectly justified, perfectly fine. Somebody comes, tries to steal you, steal your stuff, or hurt your family, hurt your wife. One of my jobs as dad is to be the provider for the family. I take that as provide not only the groceries, but provide the safety. And somebody's, you know, when my daughter was dating, I could meet the new boys, and, hey, son, good to meet you, you know, and uh, hey, what do you do for work? What do you do for hobbies? You know? And say, oh, I, you know, I like guns. Let me show you my gun collection. You know? And I'm a real good shot. Oh, I can shoot the eyeball off a frog at 100 yards without, without scratching his eyelid, you know? I remember my had a rifle range in our basement when I was a kid. 22 rifles we'd shoot in the basement of the house, East Bureau, Illinois. We got, we, we got where we would set up matches and light the match by striking it right on the right spot. You can hit right where the white part meets the red part and light the match. And then try to blow it out without breaking the match by getting the bullet to go right next to it. I mean, it got to where it's there's no competition after a while when you can put all ten bullets in the same hole. So I, I, I like guns. I've never shot anybody. But I think we have gone nuts in this country with this gun control idea. They are totally, totally wrong branch of the tree. We control the criminals, not the guns. Okay? Go to Switzerland, look at their crime rate. Everybody's required to have a weapon and a thousand rounds of ammunition. Switzerland's never been invaded. Now maybe that's because they got mountains around them, but uh, maybe that's not the reason, okay? SAT scores have plummeted since 1963. This is the Scholastic Aptitude Test, is what it stands for, SAT. This is the test the kids take to get into college. Now the college wants to see this score. You know, how smart are you? Do we want you in our college, you know? If we bring in a bunch of dummies, we're going to have to have whole new classes for bonehead English and bonehead math, and we don't want to do that, you know? And we want our name, Harvard, to have some meaning to it, you know? So you just can't come here unless you score a certain score on SAT, or college entrance placement exam or something. Well, twice in the last 40 years, they have dumbed down the test. They did it in the late 70s. They made the test dumber, made the answers easier. Notice the score went back up a little bit in the early 80s. They had dumbed down the test. They dumbed it down again in 1995. It's in the Chicago Tribune. SATs get dumber. New scores will be higher, but the standards are lower. So what does that mean? That means the test is becoming meaningless. I've got someplace in my computer, Jonathan. Did you see that? I think I'm going to give it to uh, uh, Daniel. The uh, eighth grade graduation test from 1890. Has anybody ever seen of those, any of those old tests from the 1800s? To graduate from eighth grade, they had to take a test that probably most college graduates today could not pass. And the questions they ask, you know, name all the parts of speech and give an example of how to use them in a sentence. <laughs> I was, name, name all the capitals, you know, name the population, approximate population of each state of the union. I was uh, with a family the other day somewhere I was traveling with. This lady said, was it you, Dan? Said, uh, I can name the capital of every state. That was good, yeah. Can you still do that? 
You can name the capital of every state. Anyone from? Anyone. Okay, Hawaii. H. H. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Capital H for Hawaii. The capital of every state. Leave it to Diane. Um, but SAT scores were dumbed down in uh, twice in the last 40 years, which of course puts the scores higher, which means nothing. Okay. Why don't we move the outfield, you know, why don't we move the fence in in uh, Major League Ball to 200 feet instead of 400 feet for home run? And somebody's going to get a new, brand new record. Man, I've got the world's record for home runs. You know, well, duh, they changed the standard. You know, we have the world's record for the 100-yard dash. But why don't we move it into 80 yards? I bet somebody would get a new record. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Teen suicide rates have gone crazy in this country. <laughs> I remember I was in uh, Boy Scout Troop in Morton, Illinois, at the Methodist Church there in Morton, Troop 178. One of the kids in our patrol killed himself at age 13. This was just real shortly after I had become a Christian. I got my Eagle Scout, dropped out of scouting at age late, late 15s, uh, after mid 15 for a while. Yeah. And shortly after I turned 16, I got saved and became a Christian. And I started going to church and reading my Bible and growing in the Lord. And I got concerned about all those kids that used to be in my scout troop. And one of my friends called me and said, Hey, Kent, did you hear about Bill? He hung himself last night. 13 years old. A kid in my patrol. I had been kind of felt nudged on by the Holy Spirit over the last couple of days before that to say, Go oh, witness to these guys, man. Go show them how to get saved. Ah, well, but I'm kind of busy, you know, I'm on the tennis team, and I'm real busy, and I'm in school, you know. I just didn't do it. So I don't know if it's all my fault, but it's certainly partly my fault. He's in hell, he's in hell, he certainly is. But teen suicide rates gone crazy. If I told you if you kissed a frog, it would turn to a prince, you'd say, no, frogs don't turn to princes. By the way, Ron and Shelley Hamilton, Patch the Pirate, have you ever seen the Evolution Revolution or heard the Evolution Revolution take by Patch the Pirate? That's hilarious. Uh, it's an unknown story. He uh, got cancer in his left eye, his right eye, and uh, got the, uh, no, it was his left eye, I've got this picture backwards. No. That to be his right eye. He got cancer in his eye. That was everyone. Uh, I think I got the picture inverted, but still, it had to be the right eye when he the picture inverted. No, that means his left one, the picture's inverted. That would be the left eye. Yeah. I believe it was left eye. I got the picture inverted. Who cares? Oh, I'm sure he cares, right? But uh, I said, I was, I was taking a bunch of slides. Back when I used a slide projector, you know. Uh, oh, God bless me, I'll never see another one of those, you know. But uh, I said, Shelly, I need a picture of somebody kissing their husband so I can tell the frog to the prince story. Would you kiss this frog for me? She said, Brother Hoban, my hair's a mess. You fixed your hair back. I said, she said, nobody's going to see this picture, are they? I said, no, nobody's going to see this picture, Shelly. <laughs> They've been here tonight. I started Richard Land years ago. We need to get him back. Great family up there. Uh, his, his ministry is Patch the Pirate. It's awesome. Travels around, does ministry for kids. It does it. Patch the Pirate. But, uh, long story. No, frogs aren't turned to princes. Anybody with half a brain knows that. But in the textbooks, they do. You see, we started off like an amoeba. Slowly evolved to a frog. And very slowly became a prince. <laughs> it's the very same fairy tale. Frog turns to prince. But it's kind of interesting to me. If a frog turns to a handsome prince quickly, we all know it's a fairy tale. However, if the frog turns to the prince slowly, well, now that's modern science. Why does it happening slowly make it scientific? I mean, if a man zooms through the air, flying across the room, say, wow, that's amazing, Star Trek kind of stuff. But what if he walks slowly through the air? Does that make it any less miraculous? No, frogs don't turn to princes quickly or slowly. It doesn't happen. It's a fairy tale. Either way, it's a fairy tale. What they've got now is a new magic ingredient. Instead of a kiss, no, that won't do it. You have to have billions and billions of years. Here's what happens. The human mind cannot comprehend giant numbers or giant quantities. It, your brain shuts off. So somebody says, you know, 18 million years ago, click, you can't comprehend that. 18 million, how much is that? I don't know. Your brain won't hold it. So what they've done, to make the evolution theory seem reasonable and logical, they've hidden it in millions and billions of years ago. 
And somehow now, it's, oh, wow, maybe it could happen. If you roll two dice, what's the chances of getting a 12? One on a 12, right? You have one chance on a 12 of getting a 12. Two sixes. Okay. Suppose I gave you two dice and told you, I want you to roll these for billions of years. Now, what's your chances of getting a 13? Still zero. Actually, way before the billions of years is up, you're going to wear out that dice, and you're going to wear out your hand, and get tired of playing this game, and you're going to go do something else. Okay? They said, well, if a monkey would type on a typewriter, you might eventually type out, you know, Genesis chapter 1. Now, the monkey would get tired of typing on the typewriter. Who's going to put the paper in there? Who's going to fix the typewriter? Who's going to feed that monkey? It's not going to work. Okay? We'll get into more of that later. So, billions of years is now the magic ingredient. This textbook says, fourth grade textbook. You look about dinosaurs, boys and girls, with dinosaurs, says this is billions of years ago, clues left by the dinosaurs. Billions of years ago. I spoke at a public school, I forget where I was now, but there's 300 first graders. I remember that. Huge school, there were 300 first graders. I got all these first graders in the room, and try that sometimes, speak to 300 first graders. I held up a dinosaur, and I said, boys and girls, when did dinosaurs live? Instantly. I mean, it wasn't a microsecond until all of them shouted out in unison, millions of years ago. Now, these kids can barely read, okay? How is it that Satan has gotten across his message to kids before they can even read? Where has the Christian emphasis been? Didn't Moses tell us in the book of Deuteronomy, you know, you're supposed to speak about the scriptures and read it to your kids when they lay down, when they sit down, when they stand up, when they enter the house, when they leave the house? Be constantly talking about God's Word and Scriptures. Drive this into the heart of your kids. We fail. But Satan has not failed. He has done his job. He has driven into the heart of the kids. Dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. And we here at Dinosaur Adventure Land are going to try to counteract that as best we can. Because it's not true. It's one of those brainwashing things. Kids have gone through it. I'm sorry. It happened. Okay. I didn't do it, but... I was influenced by it. I love dinosaurs as a kid. I remember reading all the books about dinosaurs, and I just read that stuff and soak it right in. And then I became a Christian at 16 and said, wow, something's different here. What I'm reading in this Bible is different than what I've been taught all my life. How can I reconcile this? For more information and other materials offered by Creation Science Evangelism, call us at 850-479-DINO. That's 850-479-3466. Or visit us online at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com.